Okay, before we start, <clears throat> a few missing tasks and work. Uh, let's see. Go here. <laughs> um, sorry, you're missing your second test. Are you aware? Can you uh, put it in the um, late papers folder? The second test. Yeah, in the late papers folder. That way I can find it. Because if you mail it to me, we'll get lost. <laughs> so I just send it back to me. Uh, so we're good. Um, okay, that's it. Good. Um, did I tell you already about the summer courses I'm teaching, fall courses? Did I say anything ever about that? No? Okay. So let me do a little bit of uh, advertisement. <laughs> so uh, this summer I'm doing a really interesting course on happiness. So if you're struggling with depression, <laughs> <laughs> like most of us or if you're you know kind of like not quite where you want to be in terms of feeling peaceful and you know in harmony with the universe <laughs> this is the class for you um it's uh, i'll be teaching it under the rubric uh in eastern philosophy but we're going to do much more than just asian texts so obviously we'll do some hindu texts some chinese texts we'll do some uh so basically we'll do the upanishads <laughs> we'll do the tao te ching from chinese tradition We'll do the book of Ecclesiastes from the Hebrew tradition. We'll do a text by Al-Ghazali, who is a medieval uh, Muslim philosopher, a uh, Sufi also, who wrote a book called The Alchemy of Happiness. And we'll do, let's see, let's see. Ah, yes, we'll do some Epictetus, some Stoic philosophy. So that will cover, oh, and we'll do the Gospel of John in the, in the Christian Bible. So these are all Eastern texts, right? They're on the east of the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> That's how I'm qualifying them. They all actually are kind of uh, very similar. The worldview is actually very stern throughout all these texts. So, so I really invite you to take that class uh, if you want to, you know, bring your life into balance. We'll also be doing some practices. This is the one class where I do practices, <laughs> right? So we'll be practicing some qigong. This is uh, similar to tai chi, but more, uh, more of a, a little more graceful. Tai chi is a little bit, you know, martial arts. <laughs> so qigong is a little more flowing. So that practice is actually a way to, you know, breathe, to come in tune with the universe with nature and this is supposed to bring inner peace and balance and I confirm it does when I don't do it uh, you, we can see the difference <laughs> right so uh, so Qigong is one of the practices we'll learn and then we'll do the Sun salutation in yoga uh, and we'll be doing some of that too and of course throughout the course we'll be practicing and learning how to meditate this is crucial basic for any spiritual practice, if you don't know how to meditate, you can't pray, you can't worship, you can't do any ritual if you can't bring yourself to that space of meditation. So that is the basis of any type of spiritual practice that you are doing in your respective religions. Meditation, if you cannot bring yourself to silence, to inner silence, you basically cannot do anything that will make you rise above <laughs> your state, <laughs> right? So the best way to rise above one state and to achieve um, peace and serenity is really to practice meditation and then you apply it in the different contexts where you are um, so any questions on that class that class will be in june so uh it'll be uh, intensive i think we'll meet maybe two to three times a week for like three hours or so or two probably not more than two uh, i don't do more than two hours so any questions on that class yes in person, yes. Um, also teaching also the same class in the fall. <laughs> so uh, then I will be doing also, well, we're, you guys did that class. That's uh, 104, I'm doing it in July. So if you have friends who you think need help in the relationships, um, bring them to that class in the summer. I'm doing that class in July, same class that we're doing now. In the fall, um, I have two more classes you haven't done yet. Um, one of them is, is a, a new class that I'm um, working on right now. It's called Plato and the Bible, but actually I'm going to be focusing on the texts in the Hebrew Bible that are a subversion of patriarchy. Most of the Hebrew Bible is patriarchal in culture, um, but actually there are some texts within the biblical text which are actually denouncing patriarchy and which have very strong female leads and which give a completely different picture of who God is, what is spirituality, and give a much more uh, feminine 
approach to, to God and to the, to, to the realm of the spirit. So these texts, I have entitled them the texts in the mother's house. So most of the Bible is really the father's house, right? It's a, most of the culture is patriarchal, but there are these texts, which I think, which I have defined as belonging to the mother's house. So if you're interested in balancing out, you know, the patriarchal background, which we all have been raised in with some mother's house philosophy and wisdom, you are totally welcome to that class. Uh, we'll be doing the book of Genesis, the book of Esther, book of Ruth, a book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, let's see, let's see, book of John. So these are all the texts we'll be doing uh, in that particular, and the Song of Songs, which um, you have a good background in from the book <laughs> that you're reading, right? So, so that class is one of my favorites. It's, it's a very interesting class. There's a lot of debate. There's a lot of... Um, if you saw the online version of it, we're fighting in this class sometimes because yes, it's new. This is not texts that have been taught. This is not texts that are mainstream. Uh, and this is not part of the classic way we were raised as believers, if we were raised as believers, right? But most of us, whether it's Islam or Hinduism or anything, it's, it's really been male dominated. So this is very new to have a feminine approach, right? To, to spirituality, which by the way, is good for both men and women, right? We, both of us, well, we all need the mother in our lives, right? Not just the father, right? So this won't be, by the way, um, we are not going to dismantle patriarchy. We're just going to add to it, right? Um, you know, I'm realizing more and more, um, I'm, I'm taking care of some kids right now. I'm realizing more and more how it's good to have a good patriarchal solid structure with rules. <laughs> like I'm getting it. But there's a time also to move beyond that. Right. So it's good to have rules, clear set rules, which is what patriarchy does. But sometimes, right, it, there is a there's a state beyond <laughs> that we should be achieving. That's what the mother's house is talking about. Right. The beyond rules. <laughs> How do we navigate life beyond rules? So any questions on that class? That's 250 in the fall. Um, philosophy 250 in the fall. Um, and then I'm doing philosophy of religion. So philosophy of religion, I, I frame it around the problem of evil. So if you've ever had this question, right? If God exists, then why? Da, 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 da. <laughs> why did this happen to me? Why did my grandmother die? Why did my father do this to me? Why did my mother, why did, right? why did I go through this? Or why did so-and-so go through this? If God exists, how can he allow this to happen? That's the question we're dealing with in the class. And we're looking at eight philosophers, or seven philosophers who have each in their own way responded to that question. We're starting with the book of Job. We're doing Maimonides, Rumi again. Um, uh, Nietzsche, um, Gabriel Marcel, Emmanuel Levinas, and Simon Weil. So that's the part, which you probably don't know any of these, but they're all addressing this question. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll be starting with ancient approaches all the way to post-Holocaust approaches, right? After the Holocaust, can we still believe in God, right? So that's a very, very interesting class. Um, also, which I'm teaching in the fall. Okay, any questions on anything? Um, if you've taken these classes before, like the 116, or um, uh, you can always take the class with me under a different number, right? So just in case you want to take any class with me and you've already taken the number, like 104 or 101, uh, you can always talk to me and I'll figure out a way to put an another number for you, <laughs> right? So that you can take it. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, hopefully, this is the last day today. So it's the last time I see you. So hopefully I will see you again, either in the summer or in the fall. Uh, it'll be really nice to, to have all of you again. You were a great class. Okay, yes. Should we just go next Tuesday? Nope, we're done. <laughs> Did we have next Tuesday? Um, I don't know if we control this, but I know there's class. Is there a class that day? Class. Really? <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, let me think about it. Yeah, I was, yeah, no, wow. Maybe not make men. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open. I'm open. I'm wide open. Okay, so I'll think about it and put something on Blackboard. I, did I put in the syllabus that we're meeting next Tuesday? No, no right? No. Look at them. <laughs> Smiling. <laughs> you don't see it on the syllabus? Oh, because class is taking place, right? Yeah, okay. Is there something on the syllabus after this? Yeah, that's today. Today, right? That's yeah. it. <laughs> Look at them so smiling, so happy. Okay. All right. Let's yes. Let's end with today. Today's the the test is this weekend, right? This weekend yeah. coming up. Yeah, that's it. And then we're done. 
Okay, great. All right, guys, advanced sex education, as promised, this is the day <laughs> we're finally going to be talking about sex, right? We haven't done so at all. We can't have a class on love without addressing this, right? So I'm really happy to have one class dedicated to this in your whole college curriculum because I know no one else is talking about this, right? Uh, I'm very happy because the last time I, I figure you guys had sex education was in eighth grade, right? Where you were told, uh, don't have sex, or if you have sex, all of these diseases will happen to you, including pregnancy. Did I summarize it well? <laughs> I think that's pretty much how it's thought, right? So it's really a fear-based approach, right? Which, which I'm very, um, you know, very disappointed with, right? It's a fear-based approach. You know, sex is something you should avoid and, you know, be careful because all these diseases will happen and God forbid you get pregnant, right? And be on birth control, all of you, right? So there's, there's this kind of very fear-based approach which really never gets into I mean, it talks about how to protect ourselves. I and mean, all of this is fear, right? Protect yourself, be careful. Uh, and it never really gets into the art of lovemaking, right? This, we do not talk about this. And this is very unusual because in ancient times, people actually taught these classes on the art of lovemaking. In fact, there were treatises that were written by men for men so that they would know how to love a woman correctly <laughs> right because yes guys there is a technique right so we're going to talk a little bit about it here right but some of these treatises are amazing you see them across the traditions in the hindu tradition you have the ananga ranga in the muslim tradition you have the perfumed garden uh, you have also, again, in the Hindu, the Kama Sutra, which most of you are familiar with. And then you have some modern texts, right, written often by women. Really, if you read these texts, you will be prose. And they, usually these texts were written for men by men um, to really teach them, you know, how to approach the woman in a way and so forth. Um, it, the text, I, the Song of Songs that I'm commenting, I believe was written for women, by women, for women, right, in order to teach us, right, how to approach the man. So, so I believe the Song of Songs in the Hebrew tradition uh, is doing uh, for women, right? If you go even, I'm most, right, even uh, go, staying in the, in the Hebrew tradition, if you read the Talmud, which is one of the holy texts of Judaism, you have so much advice, right? Um, on that so but nowadays we don't really have a class on the art of love making so today we're going to you know touch a little bit on that um how to make love right in a way that is artful and not just random <laughs> right um and what we're going to learn is what we sometimes don't know is that good sex is really like playing an instrument right how many of you were forced to play an instrument when you were younger <laughs> me too <laughs> how many played a stringed instrument Okay, how did you sound initially when you were playing your violin or cello or whatever? I was yeah. violin, right? I was doing violin. Four years before you get a clean sound in violin, by the way. It takes four years literally to get a nice sound. Pianos immediately, right? So, um, so, and, and so you get to, as you get to know your instrument, however, your sound gets better and you start to sound better and better. So um, what we're learning, so sex in a way is like learning an instrument. It's like learning your partner as though he or she is an instrument. And the key to being a good lover, right, is knowing your instrument, basically. And of course, the time you put into knowing your instrument, right? So, so we don't realize this, that really sex is an art that takes time, that takes knowing, that takes, you know, really attuning yourself to your partner. Um, there are truly some of us who are instinctive who are good at this but most of us it's an art right it's like music some of us they pick up an instrument boom they play well right and some of us are like that sexually they can really really do it well with anybody right but most of us when we pick up an instrument we need a little time right so it's the same for all of us right sex is really something that takes a while to learn it's it's an art it's an expertise it's a technique and today we're going to go into some of these techniques right Okay, so Irigaray starts uh, in her text uh, by talking about three French philosophers. These are contemporaries, these are guys that she is um, in discussion with, with regards to sex, right? We French people talk a lot about sex. Um, it's our thing. So three guys, the first one, and the first one she's going to criticize, and the last one she's going to actually expound on, right? So the first one, Sartre, S-A-R-T-R-E, this is a very famous existentialist philosopher that she's going to demolish, <laughs> right? Then we have, a. this is a long one, Merleau-Ponty. Just look on page, uh, <laughs> copy his name on page, uh, where is it? 
um, Merleau-Ponty, page 23, third paragraph, you have his name right there. M-E-R-L-E-A-U, M-E-R-L-E-A-U, Merleau, and then dash, Ponty, P-O-N-T-Y, P-O-N-T-Y. That's the second one. And then the last one, yes, <laughs> by the way, still page 23, third paragraph. M-E-R-L-E-A-U, Merleau, and then Ponty, P-O-N-T-Y. It's with a dash in between, Merleau Ponty, okay? Uh, look it up so that you don't mess it up for the test. Um, the last one is Levinas, L-E-V-I-N-A-S, right? Now, what she's going to do there by going through these three guys, right, looking at what they're saying about sex, she's actually going to see that there is a progression, right? She's going to look at Sartre, and he's going to be the one who talks about, according to her, very beginner-level sex, right? Beginner-level sex that we're going to see qualifies as an I-it relationship, if you remember Buber, right? So we're going to look first at an I-it version of having sex. This is Sartre. Then we're going to progress a little bit to the I-I, right? This is intermediate sex, I-I version. And then finally with Levinas, we're going to look at an I-U way of having sex, right? Um, using Buberian terminology. All, all of you remember what is I-it, I-U, right? Okay. And then I-I. So... She, of course, is not going to have any moral judgment on any of these stages, right? For her, these are stages that we all go through and we need to go through, but then we need to go beyond, <laughs> right? So she's not going to be critical of the I it, she's just going to describe. Here is an I it relationship, and there's nothing wrong. This is the beginner sex, this is how most of us start out, right? But we need to move on to maybe the II, and then eventually the IU for her is advanced level sexuality, right? So, so let's look a little bit at these three. Um, so let's start with Sartre, which is the I it beginner level sex. This is, by the way, high school sex. You will recognize yourselves, you will recognize your peers, you will recognize a little bit the atmosphere of high school sex, right? Um, which, of course, you regret saying we all go through this phase. But there is a time eventually, hopefully, to move beyond that phase, right? So let's look here. I'm going to summarize, and then we're going to look at the quote. It's a little complicated. So I'm, going, I'm on page 18. Okay, 18. 18. 1, 8. All right, so here she starts out. She's talking about Sartre, and he actually is saying, um, with a very serious face, that sex is always about possession. In other words, sex is always about power. Right? When you are having sex with someone, there is always a part of you that is trying to have power over that person. Um, sex is about acquiring something through the relationship. So let me give you some examples. Right, this is all. So this is, for example, the woman who has sex in order to get the guy to date her. I told you, this is high school level. We do this. We've all been tempted with this right? as a woman. You have sex in order to get that guy to date you. Right, Power. Right. Or the man who has sex in order to look like, you know, a stud or somebody who, you know, who's, how do you call it? How do you guys say it? Like, you know, when you have a lot of partners and, you know, you're kind of player, more of a man, player. right? Sorry? Player. A player. Not a player, but like, you know, kind of, you know, you're, I mean, if, if you have many partners, then you kind of look, you know, like you got it, right? So again, this is image, right? It's not about the partners. It's about the accumulation of the partners, right? It's not at all about who you're with. It's about how many people. <laughs> right. And this in a way gives you a sense as, as a man of power, like, OK, you know, I was able to get all these people there in my resume, my portfolio. Right. And it's, again, an act of power. And another way can be um, an I it right. Uh, power is um, simply uh, so more than power. Right. This is just a sex for fulfilling a need. Right. You're bored. You're lonely. She's here. He's here. Let's just do this, right? Uh, so this is really the, the, this is where we all start out. This is really where we all start out as we're teenagers, right? Sex is really affirmation of myself or trying to get something, right? So it's two ways, right? This can work. Either I affirm myself through sex or I get something through sex, right? So either I'm getting, you know, some pleasure or some relief or companionship, or I'm affirming myself as sexy or powerful and so forth. And you can see how here it's not about the person you're with at all, <laughs> right? It's about you getting what you need or becoming something in the eyes of others, right? And most of us, to be honest, we are there. Like we have all gone through this, right? This, this way of, you know, when we, 
we feel like, okay, I've been able to do this, therefore now I am this, you know, I'm, I'm there. So, uh, and of course we are in a culture right now, even beyond high school, right? Which we can define as a hookup culture, right? I was talking to a friend recently, talking, I was watching him go through Tinder. I was like, what's that? <laughs> Very naive. And he shows me, right? And I was like, wow, it's like a catalog, right? You can just go, <laughs> everybody's sitting there, you know, <laughs> looking good. And you can just swipe and, you know, you can click and get a date. For, that is amazing, the times we live in. You click and you have a date. I mean, this is shopping, right? We are shopping. So we are really in a culture, right, where it is deeply objectified and we have normalized this, right? This is normal to click on someone and go out, right? and see what happens right so we are really in the type of culture which is you know very fast very you know i'm gonna get something and then you know that's it right so that is the type of sex that sartre is talking about right where the person is really just an it to fulfill a need for one night or to make me feel good about myself for one week <laughs> right this is really and you know we are still all of us to a certain degree will remain at that level throughout life it's hard to go beyond that level right of of you know getting something from the other person or affirming myself through the other person right but this irigaray says this is not there's nothing wrong with that this is natural instinctive human way of starting out right but she says we need eventually hopefully to get beyond that level Right. So let's read a little bit what Sartre says and then her criticism of Sartre. And then uh, we'll have some questions. Okay, page 18 on the top. If this is the case, how do I desire the other and enter into a carnal relationship with him? In being a nothingness, Jean-Paul Sartre maintains that the only possible way is to enchant him. So enchant or seduce, right? This is where, by the way, seduction, right? I mean, we talked about it in the Song of Songs, right? But in general, Seduction is an act of power. I was, there's this great book that's out, um, The Art of Seduction, I think it's called. Um, I think it's written by a man um, for women. <laughs> um, but I was reading, um, a, a friend of mine, an ex-student of mine was reading me snippets of that book. And it's all about like, how do you get into the guy's mind so that they cannot let go of you? <laughs> but I'll give you one tip that she gave me. So is, this, is a, this isn't a bad one. You got a sense where the guy, his family has ignored him or neglected him, right? And then you become that, like the fulfillment of that, right? The guy will never let you go. There will always be something in the guy that is deeply attached to you, right? Suppose the guy was ignored all his life, right? Now you come in and you're like, oh, honey, you're this, you're that. And you're always paying attention to the guy. That guy will never leave you. He cannot let go of you because you're fulfilling a childhood need. This is one of the tips, right? So by the way, it's great advice. <laughs> it works, right? But do you see the manipulation? Do you see that it is ultimately about control, right? And this is irregular, right? This is problematic. Right. So any treatise that you're reading on seduction or, you know, if you read you know, how to get the guy to do this, how to get the girl to do this, any, any treatise on seduction, any writings that we are reading or watching on YouTube, how to seduce, watch out because behind it, of course, it's great advice. I'm not going to tell you it's bad advice. It works. Right. But there's still something behind it, which is pernicious, which is the desire ultimately to control the other, to get them to stay to get them to fall in love with you. And Yurigara is saying, at that moment, we should be aware, knowing Buber, right? We should be aware that we are going in the direction of an I-8 relationship where I am controlling the other person. Are you following me? And by the way, most of our culture is about control, right? It's about making the other person do X, Y, and Z and how to get them to do it, right? And, and uh, I know that because I'm very well read in those things, <laughs> because I love that stuff, right? I love being able to, you know, pull the strings, right? So there is so much out there, right? And it's really, really decent stuff. It works. But we need to always remain aware of Buber, of his voice saying, watch out, watch out. Here you're headed in the I it direction. So you want to be careful with that and not... Um, overuse that, right? So Irigaray says that here, right? Um, by the way, Sartre continues, second paragraph, thus I can possess the other, right? This is all about, all of this talk, talk that we have nowadays is about seduction, and behind it is the more pernicious desire to control or manipulate the other, right? Like I gave you the example, right, from the art of seduction. Okay, so Irigaray is criticizing now, last paragraph, 
And she says, right, right, we need to never forget, she says, that the other is and remains transcendent to me through a body, through intentions and words. Right, and here, uh, this is last paragraph of 18. And then she's quoting another work she wrote, you who are not and will never be me or mine are transcendent to me in body and in words. And then last sentence, the will to possess you corresponds to a solitary and solipsistic dream which forgets that your consciousness and mine do not obey the same necessity. So basically she's saying when we are in this direction of possession, right? When we're trying to manipulate or seduce, right? We are ultimately alone, right? The other really is not allowed to exist as another. They are your object that you're trying to get, acquire, swipe, <laughs> right? So that's what she's saying, right? Let's, when we are in that direction, that track of I, it, of trying to seduce, manipulate, or get something out of the other person or gain something through the sexual relationship, we are in a way, ultimately we end up alone. We are alone in that, even the other is there, they're still just as an object for us. Right? So we are not truly with another. We are not truly in a relationship in, in the way that we could be. Right? So again, Yurigra is not criticizing. She's just saying, you know, I get it. Right? This is decent beginner sex. This is how we are as human beings anyways. We always want to take, take, take. Right? This is a baby approach to life. Right? And she's saying, um, ultimately, hopefully, we want to outgrow that, right? to have a mature relationship. Okay, any questions on this first one? Um, or clarification, or things you want to share. Um, of course, this is the class where nobody talks. I know. Everybody's looking down. Actually, you guys are pretty better than the others. You're actually, I taught this class once, nobody was looking at me. <laughs> it's crazy. So at least you guys are looking at me, so I'm happy. Okay, good. So moving on now to intermediate level. And this is a little better because you're not using the other, right? You're not, um, they're not just an object that you take for one night and then discard or ghost the next night, right? We all know this. This ghosting, by the way, is part of the I, it. How many of you have ghosted someone before? Okay, y'all, look at y'all, <laughs> right? This is, this is object, right? Take, discard, take, discard. So if you're going to get rid of someone, at least send them a message, right? This, <laughs> right, that's what Irigaray would say. Irigaray is not saying, you know, stay with that jerk. You know, she's saying, you know, if you're going to cut them off, you know, let them know. <laughs> right, that, that's what you're about to do. Okay. You know, I should, I should teach a whole section in this class on the art of breaking up, you know, because... You know, I, let me say something about that, actually, just parentheses. You know how we say, you know, how marriage is so sacred, right? And, you know, being with someone and, and just entering, you know, the process with, with someone is, is sacred. And, and it is, right? But I would like to add that separating from someone can also be a sacred activity, right? The way you separate from someone right, can also be a sacred task. The way you do it can be transformative for both you and them, right? If you do it like a big jerk, then yeah, it's not going to go well. It's, it's just going to make things worse. But there is a way of breaking up which is graceful. And when you're able to do it like that, you can impact the other in ways you have no idea, right? This can really be life altering for the other person when you, sometimes relationships need that space for people to grow right? Not always, right? But sometimes breaking up is a way to release the person to help them get where they need to go and they cannot do it with you there, right? It's, it's acknowledging that sometimes we need to release the other to allow them to be on their journey and hopefully they will be back, right? So it can be just as sacred as joining with them, separating with them, releasing them can be a even more profound act of love than receiving them unto oneself, right? So we saw that with the Song of Songs, right? When she releases him, it is a profound act of love. So, I, you know, just to, some, we need to understand that, especially in our culture where, you know, we have so many relationships that begin and end, begin and end. Learning how to end a relationship with beauty and grace, right, is, is also as important as learning to begin a relationship with beauty and grace, right? So that's why I would love one day to do like a whole workshop on how to break up with grace, right? Um, because it can be a profound act of love the way you do it, right? So, okay. Back to Merleau-Ponty. All right, so the intermediate. Um, intermediate is, um, a lot of us are there also, right? We'll all have a phase like this. 
this is when we kind of, you know, have been through a few relationships, have been hurt, starting to see that it's very complicated and a little bit, um, you know, murky. And we start to just stay by ourselves, right? And we give up on the dating scene and we end up having to take care of our own sexual needs, right? Whether we do it in, there are many ways, of course, we can do that, but we end up basically on our own and our sexual needs are taken care of by ourselves, right? We don't, we don't offer ourselves anymore, right? And we just um, stick to ourselves. And, you know, there are many ways we do that. And Iriguera is saying, well, okay, you're by yourself. Your sexual energy is now about you, <laughs> right? You are pleasuring yourself, right? Uh, and it's about you discovering yourself, exploring yourself, and pleasuring yourself. And again, Iriguera, no judgment, <laughs> right? This is not, this is a post-moral philosopher, right? She's saying, okay, this is a good step. This is a step in the direction of, you know, getting to know yourself and becoming um, independent. But she's saying again, beware, don't stay in that phase too long, right? And, and you want to realize that ultimately your sexual energy is not just there for you, it's there to be offered up to another human being, right? Sexual energy is supposed to be a gift that you offer up, right? It's not just for you, right? So that you can just relax on your own, right? So let's look a little bit at what Merleau-Ponty says here about that. So Merleau-Ponty says something slightly different from what I just said. Um, so to be fair to him, I'll, I'll reiterate what he's saying. He's saying that ultimately every sexual experience, you end up alone. <laughs> so even you're sleeping with that person, you wake up the next day and you feel like somehow you haven't connected. And ultimately, he says, that's the essence of sex. You're never going to really be able to connect um, because it is impossible, right? So that's Merleau-Ponty, kind of pessimistic view that. And, you know, a lot of us or will or have experienced this where you, you know, you, you sleep with someone and the next day you wake up and you're like, oh my God, who are you? <laughs> you know, who am I? <laughs> what am I doing here? What happened? Or, you know, you feel like even with your husband or wife, right? You can feel like you, you slept together, you had sex, but then it didn't feel like you were connecting. Something was not happening. It wasn't happening, right? And now you're wondering what's happening. Meloponte is like, it's normal <laughs> because you can never really transcend yourself towards another. Of course, Irigaray is going to disagree, right? But Meloponte says that, right? Ultimately, sex is always a solitary act, he says, right? And then we have made it a thing in our culture, right? Sex has become literally a solitary act for most of us. Um, actually, I was reading an article in the New Yorker saying that you guys' generation are the generation that has the less sex than any generation before it. People stay to themselves, right? There's too much craziness out there. It's too murky, it's too complicated that we prefer to, right, stick to ourselves. So solitude, right? Sexual solitude is what Melo Ponty is talking about. So Irigaray, of course, is going to be like, ah, stop it, you know, stop being so, you know, pessimistic. Um, two things, right? Number one, she's going to say, well, you're not connecting because you don't know how to connect, <laughs> right? And she's going to say, let me show you what you can do, how you can make love so that you end up with a connection each time and you don't have to, you know, lay in bed next to the person and feel bad about yourself because, you know, it didn't happen, what you wanted to happen right? There were no sparks. There was no connection, right? So she's going to say, well, let me show you a little bit how you can go about so that you have a connection, right? At the end of the experience. So let's see a little bit what she says. Uh, page 21. So first she criticizes him. Uh, one, two, three, fourth paragraph. And she's criticizing his, his diagnostic, right? That when we have sex with someone, we always end up in a way, never reach them. We, we always end up alone, right? And she says, well, um, this subject object dichotomy also depends upon the manner in which sexuality itself is conceived. So she's saying you're conceiving it wrong, right? Maurice Merleau-Ponty considers sexuality as ambiguity and indeterminacy, which are related not only to the body, but to life in general. Now here's the key. As a result, sexuality does not favor the emergence of intersubjectivity. Okay, what does intersubjectivity mean? Anybody know what does that word mean? Intersubject. What does inter mean? Think international, intercontinental. What's inter? What does inter mean? Yes? Between. Right, so she's saying this type of sex that he's talking about does not favor the between. 
There is no in between. There is no connection between subjectivities. Nothing happens between them. What he say, right? And so she says we we therefore need to move on to and see how we can actively weave a connection. Is there a way to have sex in which that connection can be woven so that we don't end up, you know, stranded next to the other person, feeling like you know I I don't I don't feel anything, right? Um, Okay, so let's see now, which moves us now to the last part, which is the part we'll focus on, which is advanced level sex. <laughs> so let's see. Okay, so here she's going to start with Levinas. I'm on page 26. Um, 24. 24. Okay, so she's going to, this one she's going to not criticize she's going to build on what he's saying elaborate what he's saying because she feels like this guy is on the right track he's getting what i'm trying to say um, so let me summarize right before we look at the quote so now we're entering into an iu way to have sex right and what that looks like which for irigor is what we should be aiming for right so um so this iu she says has to do with a way that we touch the other person so it's interesting because remember, Irigaray is, is not a conservative, right? She's writing in a context where marriage is not a thing anymore, right? People in France in general actually not getting married, right? People don't get married. It's not, it's, people don't believe in that anymore. So how do you create, how do you frame the sexuality so it's still sacred and noble and, and human, right? And she says, well, we don't need these outward right uh, rituals in order to sanctify the sex the way we have sex can make the sex holy are you following me let me say that again so she's saying we don't need this outward ritual to sanctify or to make the sex holy right she's saying actually the way we have sex with a person can become can make the whole experience holy sacred and profound right and she's saying even we have the this whole ritual of marriage in the bedroom, we don't know what they're doing, and it's not necessarily that great and that holy, right? And this is true, right? You have a lot of instances, right, in, in marriage of rape, of, you know, violation and so forth. So it doesn't mean the fact that you're married doesn't mean the sex is going to be, is going to trickle down in the sex, right? The big, beautiful ceremony, right? Um, so, so she's saying that's why we need to go deeper than just these external rituals, right? We can still do them, but we need to go deeper. We need to find a way to sanctify the bedroom, <laughs> right? We need to find a way to engage with another in a way that the sex turns out to be uh, holy and sacred and, and, and meaningful for both parties, right? So this is where, so she's uh, starting with this. Um, so what Levinas is saying is that there is actually a way of touching, right? Which we have to become uh, awakened to. There's a, and now she's going to focus male, female, right? So, but of course you can take it any way you want. You can reverse everything. This, this goes for both, but she's specifically here writing male, female, but of course it works both ways, right? So she's saying there's a way of touching actually for the man to touch the woman, which in a way can create this IU relationship. And once the man understands that, there will never be a, an experience which ends up being without a connection. The connection will always be created in that way. So let's look at this particular way of touching that Levinas is talking about and that Irigaray is going to expound on. So um, on third paragraph, page 24. <clears throat> All right, so this way of touching, first of all, Levinas calls the caress. So the caress is, is a concept which um, encompasses everything that Levinas is trying to say about this IU way of touching. It's not just about caressing, it's everything that is entailed. Right? It's a concept which um, um, entails everything. So, so Levinas is saying the caress consists in seizing upon nothing. It's soliciting what ceaselessly escapes its form toward a future, never future enough, and soliciting what slips away as though it were not yet it. And I wish to add, this is man's caress. It searches, it forages. It is not an intentionality of disclosure, but of search. Okay, what is he talking about? What is this way of touching? How would you explain this way of touching to us, to the rest of us? What would be one way to translate this very poetic passage? What is he saying? Yes, this is uh, page 24, third paragraph. 
And this is the Levinas quote, right? This is not Eric Wright, this is Levinas. Actually, there is one word in the English language which summarizes everything we just read. It starts with an F and it's not the word you're thinking of right now. <laughs> which one is it? F-O? F-O-R? Foreplay, very good, excellent. She is talking or he is talking here about foreplay. So let me stop on that and we are going to define what it is and we are going to see why it is important. And by the way, this is, a, this is not obvious, right? For women, it's obvious, but not so much for guys, right? Guys have a different approach to sex than we do. So it's a very interesting uh, moment to stop on that and explain what it is and why it is important. And this is now you're going to get at this point the woman's perspective on sex, right? By the way, this perspective is hidden in our culture. It is completely hidden. If you watch any movie, whether it's movie for kids or movie for adults, right? The female desire is absolutely not um, um, depicted, right? Any HBO, you have this crazy sex in the elevator. This is not possible, guys. <laughs> it's like, we cannot do this, right? Then you, and the, you go from the movie all the way to the porn culture, obviously, which is entirely focused on the male desire, so that males think that we like that stuff. We don't, <laughs> right? Um, so we have a culture where the female desire is completely hidden. It is not expressed, whether in the literature, mostly in the movies, whether in the internet, you will not have a correct, accurate depiction of female desire. You will have an accurate depiction of male desire, perhaps. Maybe not. I, I cannot speak for the males, right? Maybe I'm wrong. But you will not have a correct depiction of female desire. So this moment that we're about to engage in, this is the unique moment you will get an, a glimpse of what women desire in the bedroom, right? And the main thing women desire in the bedroom more than the amazing climax you could give her, right? Which is what men think we want. It's not so much that, it's the foreplay. The foreplay is indispensable. And so let me describe what she means by foreplay, right? Foreplay is everything you're doing before the climax. Everything you're doing to warm that woman up. Every word you're telling her, every touch you're giving her, every embrace, every kiss, every caress, everything you're doing just to get to know her body, right? Everything you are expressing to her. And this happens way before the bedroom. This can happen months in advance. How you talk to her, what you do for her, what you give her. And then in the bedroom, as you continue, are you talking to her? Are you giving to her, right? Are you taking the time to explore her body, to get to know her? All of this is way beyond, way before the climax. And for us women, what Irigaray is going to say is the climax means nothing if it doesn't have this. We can climax, if we don't have this, it's not going to be an amazing experience. We'll tell you it was an amazing experience, but doesn't mean it was, right? So this is the first thing. So foreplay, that's the definition, right? Everything you're doing to explore that woman's body, to know that woman's body, to express how you feel about that woman's body, right? And soul, obviously. Um, and this is, of course, what men tend to skip, right? Because men are faster, right? They want to get to the goal. They want to score and get to the climax, right? For the woman, it doesn't work like that. And it is very useful for the man to realize that, right? Because we are not trying to get to the climax. We are interested in the journey, <laughs> right? The man is destination oriented. The woman is process oriented. Please write this down. Put it on your fridge. Memorize it, right? Man is goal oriented, destination oriented. And please do not abandon that, man. We need the destination. <laughs> the goal is good. We are happy with the goal. But we women tend to be more focused on the journey there, the process there. And we want the scenic route, just so you know right? We don't want no shortcuts to the destination. The longer you take, the better for us, right? This is very hard for men, by the way, because men have to exert considerable self-control in order to take you through the scenic route to be compassionate with the guys you're with, right? Because they are like, really need self-control. This is why, by the way, before you can really love a woman sexually, as a man, you have to learn to control your sexual energy. You have to know how to control it. You have to be able to master it because you will need that mastery in the bedroom to take the scenic route. Am I making sense or am I speaking Chinese right now? Are you following me? Right? So very important. So I would really encourage, right, men in the room, 
take the time to learn to master your energy, right? So that you can then take that woman on that scenic route, right? If you're too fast, if you're not in control of your energy, how are you going to take her on the scenic route? You are going to finish so quickly and she will be sitting there, damn. <laughs> You'll be asleep and she'll be like, Mm. <laughs> frustrated, right? So that's the first thing we need to realize is that the man and the woman are very different. And it's very important to understand that the woman likes the lengthy process, the journey, the scenic route, right? Now, there are two main reasons why we like the scenic route. So let me give you two reasons, very important reasons, so you understand why this is important, right? Number one, it's an ethical reason. Number two, it's a pleasurable reason. So argument from ethics, argument from pleasure, right? So first of all, ethics. For a woman to feel like she was not used as an object in the sexual encounter, she needs you to do that, right? In other words, if you go too quickly, inevitably, whether you love that woman or not, whether you're married to that woman or not, inevitably she's going to feel used. She's going to feel like somehow she didn't get her she got the shorter end of the stick, right? So this is the first thing for the ethics. The woman needs that foreplay, the time you take to know her, for her to feel like a you and not like an it. That is the difference between I it and I you sex is the foreplay. If you skip the foreplay, if you move too fast, if you don't take the time to express your love physically to her, she's going to inevitably feel like an it. And this can be, you can be so loving, she will not feel it. This is what we need to understand is that your love language as a man is not the same as the woman's love language. For you, getting her to climax, there, I show her I love her. For her, you skip the foreplay, she doesn't hear your love, right? You can be the most amazing stud, super good at this and so forth, but if you do not take the time for the foreplay, she's not gonna hear that you love her. And she's gonna hear rather that you used her. This is the first reason. And by the way, it's ethical, of course, because it takes considerable self-control from the man. The man has to put himself aside. It is a sacrificial act on the part of the man to allow the woman that time. We have to understand that, right? This necessitates that the man sacrifice his own language, his own impulses, in order to allow you the time to get where he wants you to get, right? So, so it is an act of love, right, from the part of the man to hold back and allow and give the woman the time she needs and give her the love she needs to get take the scenic route right it is in a way the most profound act of love a man can do in the bedroom is to take the time and take her on that ride right um and it is hard for a man to do that it's not easy for a man to control himself that long right? and we want it more we want hours of it they're like come on babe you know, let's do this right and you want to go on and on right so we have to understand that um so that's the first thing ethics right this is the one way that ethics enters the bedroom is through this act of self-contraction on the part of the man to allow you to have pleasure right this is also allowing her to come before you right this is all the way you can be a gentleman in the bedroom this is ethics in the bedroom right ethics also goes there <laughs> right it's not just for you know, traffic lights so that's the first reason any questions on that first reason before we get to the argument from pleasure anything about that i don't know when everyone wants to talk in this class all right here's a second yes Knorr. so this is the reason why it is ethical yeah. So two things. It's ethical because the man has to rein himself in, and this in itself is an act of ethics, right? It's an act of making room for the other, right? But it's also ethical because the woman doesn't feel like a thou or a you if you don't go through that process. You see what I mean? And you said that this is the first point. This is the first point. Why? Proving that this is what you're doing? Yeah, this is the first reason why we like the scenic route, right? So first reason, ethical reason. Why women need the scenic route, need more time, need the foreplay, need that time. Right. Second reason, the argument from pleasure. This is very important to realize, and it will clear up a lot of misunderstandings to, to realize this. Um, for a woman, now this is not all women. Some women get ready very quickly. Um, they're the lucky few, right? Most women need at least 40 minutes of warm up before they can properly open up to the man, right? And many times, if you go too fast, the woman is going to feel pain in the intercourse and you're going to worry like what's happening why am i hurting her are we incompatible what's what's going on what's wrong with you <laughs> but 
it sometimes it's only that, right? That the woman needs more time to get aroused and you have to take that time to bring her to the point where she can properly open up, right? Now, some women who experience pain in intercourse, sometimes it's not just the man now, it's things she went through that made her contract, right? And so sometimes it takes longer. It takes emotional healing as well as the foreplay to get that woman to open up. So if the woman is feeling any type of pain, just know this. It's not you necessarily. It's not incompatible. It simply means either she's been through some trauma before and she's having a hard time opening up, right? Or you need to take more time, right? To really, And you can take more time with that woman emotionally. Maybe then step back. Don't have sex yet. Wait until she's able to open up emotionally to you, until she's ready emotionally, until she's healed of the trauma. And then you can try again. Or simply it can be you're not doing enough foreplay, right? You're not taking at least 40 minutes, right? To warm her up, to warm her body up. So this is something to know that just for the pleasure, like we are going to really experience real pleasure only through that process, right? Otherwise we will experience your pleasure, <laughs> right? But we will never really know our own pleasure, right? So if as a man you're interested in awakening that woman to her pleasure, right? This is the, the scenic route is necessary, right? For her to really open up so that she can experience on the same level of pleasure as, as the man, right? By the way, there are some regions, right? In, in a woman that can only be opened by a man's love, right? And it takes that love to really open up those regions. She, she cannot open up if you don't take that time, right? Um, and by the way, it's not just the, the physical foreplay, the emotional foreplay is also playing a huge role. Many women have problem opening up because emotionally they don't feel ready to be with you, right? So it could be two things. It could be you didn't take enough time for foreplay or emotionally she's not yet ready. She wants to be ready, right? She, she feels it should be the right time, but emotionally she's not there. And so more needs to be done to open her heart, right? Um, so yeah, so, and it's interesting because once the woman experiences the 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 pleasure she could experience, which is, by the way, very rare. I have to say, we women are so detached from our own pleasure and so focused on the pleasure of the other that most of us never really take the time to really nurture, right, our, or cultivate our ability for pleasure. And the, the person who is missing out is not just the woman, but also the man. Because the man is in a way irrigated by the woman's pleasure. Let me explain. In ancient China, this is a really interesting idea. In ancient China, it was said that um, when a woman, uh, sorry, when a man was uh, sleeping with a woman, he would actually get to the point, um, and this was in many ancient traditions, the woman was considered miraculous because she gave life, right? She was considered divine because she was able to do what only God can do, which is bring life into the world. And so it was believed that when the man have sex with a woman, they get to that, they're able to reach that point of divinity and be themselves rejuvenated through her, right? So there was this, this very profound belief that the man can become rejuvenated through the sexual contact with a woman because he's entering that sacred space where life where life flows from the woman, right? So in, in many ancient cultures, it was seen as, for the man, a way to rejuvenate himself, to receive new strength, to be reborn through the woman, right? And so what, what Irigaray is saying here is that if you're able to really open that woman up, what she will give you through her pleasure is this rejuvenation, right? There is a power that comes when a woman is able to experience her full pleasure. It flows back into the man right? And it gives him new life. So it's not just the man that can give the woman new life. We know that already. Definitely the man gives us new life, right? But we can also give new life, but only if we are attuned with our pleasure. And so we women, very often, we don't take care of our pleasure because we don't want to be selfish and we're busy taking care of the man's pleasure, right? The culture, by the way, is gearing us to do that, right? We are taught very early in high school, you are there for the man's pleasure, right? But we do not understand that when we neglect our pleasure, we are not able to flow back into that man and, and give him new life in the same way that he gives us new life. Are you following? So that's why we need to focus and cultivate our pleasure and get there so that we can give this gift to the man, right? The man doesn't just need you to do a few technical things so he can feel good. The man needs you to be open 
And this is what we find is so hard to do, especially when it comes to sex. There is nothing harder for a woman who has been hurt before, and we all have, to open up again sexually to a man. This is incredibly difficult for us. But the, if we were able to do it, we would have so much to offer to that man, right? There's so much that is given back to the man when a woman is truly able to open up. And so for the man to know that, right, would be for the man to help us get to our pleasure because it will flow back in, into him. It will rejuvenate him, right? Do you follow? This is very powerful because I know the man rejuvenates us. We all know that. We have all experienced, or we will, right, that the man, right, through his energy can powerfully rejuvenate a woman. I mean, this definitely, a man with very powerful, pure sexual energy, they can just heal that woman from everything. They can give her new life. It's a baptism. It's a rebirth. But what we do not know is that the woman also can do that to the man. And we do not do it because we are not in tune with our pleasure. It is through our pleasure that we give back this life to the man, right? Yes, of blessing. What do you mean? Where, so you know how we say that, or like you just said that, uh, sort of like when a woman is sex, like the emotionality is part of her whole perception, that also gives back to the man as previous had. Oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. This is the tragedy, right, that we live in, is that we are unable to unlock ourselves anymore, right? This is, we are the culture which has the most trouble opening up, both the man and the woman, right? Men can open up easily sexually, but, it, but emotionally cannot. And if the man is not open emotionally, we cannot open. <laughs> you see what I mean? If we don't feel your love coming to us from your heart, we're feeling like we can't open up. We'll go through the motions. We are such good actresses. I'm sure everybody here deserves an Oscar or will deserve an Oscar for the way you are you know, communicating to the man that he's the best in bed, right? We are so good at faking everything. I mean, we don't fake, we're just kind, right? So, <laughs> but what we don't realize, right, is that just like we need the man's emotional openness so that we can open up sexually, the man needs us to open up sexually so we can revive him, right? So this is, I think, the task of this age is to figure out a way that we can open up to each other again, right? After having gone through, we've all been hurt, right? How do we now emerge from that more loving and not less loving? This is what the class was trying to teach. How do you come out of the hurt more loving rather than less loving, right? And the, the test is in the bedroom because that's where you know if you're able to open up, even if you've truly healed. And it's very difficult uh, often, yes. Um, this one's like a uh, society. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna, I don't think it's just because of porn, because obviously it's happened before, but like, uh, porn definitely exacerbates that problem. Like, people have performing society, so it becomes more about like how the sex looks rather yeah. than how it feels. And I feel like yes, I love like, that. The IU Storm Club is more about how it feels. I love what you're saying. Absolutely. It, it, it is about how it looks. And all of us are trying to look good because we're imagining ourselves in our little movie <laughs> because everything is a movie, right? Um, and then we lose contact with the other, right? And, and speaking of porn, right, the, 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 the tragedy with porn is that you get so used to seeing these ways of having sex which have nothing to do with the female pleasure it's very difficult then to switch back it's possible obviously we all the brain is plastic i believe in the brain changing the body changing nobody is stuck in their ways right but it's very important if you want to i, I would speak to the men here if you really want to uh be an amazing lover you will want to gradually let go of that habit if you have that habit because that the, what you're witnessing in the porn um is usually nothing to do with what we really need, right? It is focused on the male pleasure. So you will enter the bedroom expecting her to do some things to you. And then you're missing the point <laughs> completely of what it means to truly make love to a woman, right? I don't believe our culture is teaching our men that they are the givers and not the takers. The culture is teaching the men that they are the takers and the woman is the giver. This is what I am seeing in the porn industry everywhere. The woman is the giver, the man is the taker. And what we're learning here is that, no, the advanced sex is the opposite. The man is the giver and the woman is the receiver. And that is what gets you in these realms where you can rejuvenate each other very powerfully.
right? When you're giving your energy to someone and rejuvenating her and allowing her then when she's opening up and able to rejuvenate you, that's the climax, right? That we are still, most of us, struggling to attain. And it's fine. It's normal. It's, it's you know, sex is, is really, in a way, is the hardest task, right? Because it necessitates absolute, uh, absolute openness, right? Which is in a way, absolute nakedness, right? And this is so hard because we are so protective, right? So that's what we're learning here. Uh, oh my goodness, you know what? I was thinking I had till 6.20. Can you believe it? <laughs> when I was looking at the clock. Can I have five more minutes just to do that? A couple more quotes, is it okay? It's a good topic, no? <laughs> okay, so one more thing, the gesture word I wanna talk about. Um, page 26, second paragraph. Um, the caress is a gesture word. Let's talk about that a little bit. What does it mean, a gesture word? Where is it? Oh. Uh, second paragraph on page 26. What does it mean, a gesture that is a word? What's a gesture, first of all? See you, that's fine. <laughs> What's a gesture, usually? Okay, movement, Wait, a, a touch or something, right? What's a word? Why do you speak? To so talk about what? And usually, when you're in a conversation with a friend, are you saying, oh, there's a book on the table? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. What are you saying to them? Yes. Yeah, from you, from within. Words is expression of within. Gesture word is a touch, which is the expression from within. Please write this down. A gesture word is a touch that is the expression from within. Now we're getting really into the depths of what it means to have advanced sex. A, a gesture word is a touch that is an expression from within. Basically what she's saying here is that sex is supposed to be the language of your emotions. Meaning you should have some emotions <laughs> before you get into the situation. You should have some love because what is sex? Sex is the language by which you express your love. Now, if you have no love for that person, why are you talking, <laughs> right? Why are you going through these motions, right? So she's saying, ultimately, if we want to get to the IU relationship in sex, we need to learn to, we need to make sure before we engage with anyone sexually that there is actually some love in your heart for that person so that the sex is the accurate expression of what is within you. If there is nothing within you, please just spend the night watching a movie. <laughs> right? You don't have to do this. Why lie? <laughs> right? Why express with your hands what your heart doesn't feel? Right? Why disconnect yourself like this? Right? So he recognizes things very important. What really makes for an IU relationship beyond the technique, the foreplay and so forth, is to make sure that whatever you are expressing is coming from your heart. If you have nothing in your heart, maybe you just need to you know, just watch a movie together. You know, go take a walk, whatever, smoke pot. I don't know, do something. But you don't need to do something which is not an expression of something you're feeling inside. Right? And so what we're, we're learning here is that good sex or advanced sex right necessitate a certain degree of emotional maturity if you don't have emotional maturity you're not ready right if your love has not matured to a certain degree for that person you're not and if you don't feel you love that person yet take your time wait where's the rush <laughs> right uh, i'll remind you of a passage in the song of songs do you remember the the part where he opens her garden anybody remember it Right? He goes and cuts, he takes the fruit, right? And, and this is actually, we didn't talk about it, but this is actually a possible moment where they're actually sleeping together for the first time, right? Now, notice how he calls her. He gives her seven times the same name. Before he enters the garden, he calls her a certain word. Anybody remember what that is? And it's seven times, very powerful. There's a climax. He calls her seven times this particular word. Anybody know what is the, the deepest term of endearment you can offer someone? Um, in the biblical in the biblical world <laughs> Flower? no <laughs> what's the highest yes my bride. yes my bride my bride seven times right he calls her my bride this is the deepest term seven times and then he's ready not once not twice the, the bride not three times seven times he calls her my bride at that moment he has such a climax of emotional maturity now is the time right reserve your sex to the time where you have seven levels of emotional maturity. Not one, not two, not three. Are you on the seventh level of love? 
now you're ready, right? And too often we go, even though there's not even one level we have exact over here. <laughs> Why? <laughs> right? Why do you do this, right? What, what we're learning is that if, of course, you can do it. Every, everything is allowed, right? But if you want to get to that higher experience of sex, you need to make sure that emotionally you are on the seventh level and then you are ready actually to experience something adult and mature and profound, right? Otherwise, the sex will be like, you know, you watched a movie and it was okay and, you know, whatever. Most of us, right? We come out, it was whatever. And we don't know why. This is why. <laughs> you have not reached the seventh level, right? So um, this is so important, the emotional component. And this is why, by the way, it's impossible really uh, to test drive a partner. I know we have some people, and this I'll end with this, right? We have some people who say, well, I don't know if I want to date you or marry you until I've had sex with you because I want to make sure we're compatible, right? Now, this is going to fail. Let me tell you why. Because you cannot test drive a partner. In other words, you cannot know who they are sexually until you have reached that commitment level. Before the commitment, the partner is only going to be a stunted version of herself. Let me explain. If you... It is the commitment you give to that woman that will open her up sexually, right? Before, if you do not have that commitment, she might go through with the sex, but she will only be a stunted, limited version of who she could be if there was that commitment. And so she will not be really herself at that moment. So you cannot know what she could be after the commitment. You see what I'm saying? This is what I'm saying. Do not fall for this, that I need to test drive this woman. If you have chemistry, if you have connection, you're good. Any dysfunction afterwards, you can work it out, <laughs> right? You just need the chemistry and the connection. You don't need to try the person out because you won't get a clear reflection of who they are before the commitment because it is the commitment and the love which opens up or the woman to the degree that she could be opened up, right? So, okay. So any questions, any last questions before we end? Um, any, yes. Oh yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the final project. Yes, briefly, I forgot to talk about that. Okay, so briefly, the final project, um, you, you should find it on Kindle on Amazon. Did you find it? Oh, you can find it on Amazon? Look, look my name up. Just put my name in there. <laughs> yeah. So guys, try to get the Kindle version. Um, you can buy the actual book. It's a really nice book, but it's expensive. So get the Kindle. If you bought it on Amazon, you do the review on Amazon. Okay, and you do just whatever you want. It can be a bad review, I don't care. Um, if you haven't bought it and you've just gotten like maybe a PDF from the library or whatever, then you do the one page single spaced response and you put it in the, I mean, you put everything in the, you put the review or the page response in the final project folder, right? So, but if you bought the book, yes, you can do a review on Amazon and just give me that, right? Yes. Um, I got it on Amazon, but I wrote the one page. Is that okay? You what? I got it on Amazon, but I wrote a one -page. That's fine. Yeah, you can do it. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, you can leave a historical review or you can do the one page. It doesn't matter. Yes. No, I mean, there's the book on reserve. So the book is on reserve in the library, so you can access it for a couple hours every day if you want. You can read it like that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, any other questions on the final project? Okay, great. All right, guys, you can go. Whoever still has questions you want to ask, you can come to me now, or you can go, and I will see you hopefully in another semester. <laughs> there you go.